Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Another episode of the Words Wise Podcast. I'm Joe DeVille. Howdy ho, Jesse Wikowski. I'm Chris Hall. Chadwick Kramer. So Chris Hall is a longtime friend and an educator at Sierra College. And today we're going to be talking about civilization and the environment. So Chris, why don't you just start us off? Thanks, Joe. Happy to. So um, hello, Words Wise listeners. Uh, we're going to talk about civilization and the environment today. They're, um, I think by their very nature, these topics are emotionally charged for some reason. And I think it's partly because I'll just talk a little bit about my background, if that's okay, guys, and how I got kind of more interested into this field than I ever before. Um, it's always been something I loved. Wilderness, I mean, the environment in that sense. Uh, exploring wild places, growing up in Nevada County, going to the Yuba River and all those wonderful places that we have the luxury to explore um, living in the Sierra foothills. But it was my education, really, not only my formal education, you know, the years of college I did, but also just reading things, picking things up along the way that I was interested in, conversations with friends on these subjects that led me to feel like I was beginning to piece together parts of a puzzle. And the puzzle began to reveal an image. And the image I saw in the puzzle was not a pleasant one. And it was a, an image that revealed the impact of human behavior, human existence, I guess I should say, really, uh, human habits, human lifestyle, human life ways on the planet. And to use a kind of switch analogies here, I felt like as I looked at that picture, I was sort of in some kind of a murder mystery, you could say. And it was one of those murder mysteries with like a really bad twist ending, you know, the kind, or like a Tales from the Crypt kind of a deal, where the murder, the investigator, I mean to say, where the investigator realized that he was a murderer, because my hands are red. So I wanted to start with that. Um, I do want to talk about this topic in kind of a serious way, you know, as, as much as possible. Um, but we have to keep our levity. We have to keep our humor, our good humor. We have to keep um, honest with ourselves, which means we have to recognize that our hands are red too, right? Especially West, uh, descendants of Western Europeans, which I know I am. I can speak for my heritage. I'm especially responsible on this continent for the genocide of the Native American people. People who look like me, I should say, were responsible for that. So there's a history there um, of people who were living in touch with the land, relatively speaking, doing little impact com when compared to the vast, staggering effects of a civilized way of life on the earth. Um, so that's kind of my introduction to the topic. I know it's a somber and serious note. Sometimes when I talk about this stuff, I feel a little bit like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. Not that I'm that deluded. I'm much more like Samwise or Frodo, <laughs> believe me. But I feel a little bit like Gandalf in this one respect, which is that I feel like I'm going to be seen as a, a storm crow, a doom bringer, right? Like wherever, wherever people who are talking about these topics go, it's all doom and gloom. It's all bad news. There's never any good news. And that's a fear. That's a very real concern. However, we have to know what's really going on. We have to look with our eyes wide open at the situation in the world around us and make our best judgments. It's all any of us can do. And the best judgment I have has led me to conclude that civilization is doing vast harm to the planet. Um, I should define civilization if you guys don't mind me saying yes, one more do. thing. I want to get you guys involved in the conversation here. But um, civilization is important to understand in the sense I'm using it. Because I don't mean people getting along. I don't mean society or having collaboration or cooperation between human beings. That's important. And non-civilized people, many Native American groups, some Native American groups were civilized. Some Native American groups built huge, vast cultural complexes that involved sedentary living and the necessary import of services from elsewhere. But that's the definition of civilization we need to start with as a starting point for the conversation. Civilization comes from the Latin word through a few different derivations, but through the Latin word civitatis, which means city-states. So it's people living in the city-state. It's the rise of the city-state, which equals civilization. And a civilization in this sense of a city-state means that you have an urban center that by definition is has too many people living in that area for the land in that area to support. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what that means is that importation of goods from elsewhere is necessary for the survival of the people living in that city-state situation. 
makes sense. And what you have to do, what comes next is usually you have to take things from people who are living in a different way, in an uncivilized way, which have been called barbarians and savages and all kinds of other, you know, dirty names by the civilized peoples of history, from the Romans to the Europeans to whoever you want to name. Civilized people generally kind of demonize the uncivilized. And part of that, I think, is so they can have a claim to virtue. We're, we're good. Our culture is more advanced. We're more, and that's the, the definition you'll usually hear for civilization, an advanced culture or a refined way of living on the earth. Um, so where am I going with all this? Basically, civilization, living in city-states, requires the importation of goods from elsewhere, which often requires killing people and taking their stuff. If people, one of my favorite authors says it this way, Lyra Keith says, if people are living in their trees and other people need to cut down those trees, the people trying to live in the trees or live on the land in a sustainable way are always going to lose. Um, in, in the long scope of history, that's been the case. We've had people, we've had empires, imperialism, and that's driven out people who are trying to live in a sustainable way. And who, for instance, on this continent, Buffalo, passenger pigeons, the litany of loss is long, but those are two pretty star kind of, you know, celebrity species we most of us know about that were driven extinct. They were here for tens of thousands of years, just like the native peoples living on this continent, at least tens of thousands. Since the beginning of time, if you believe the myths of most native groups, including our Nisanan, uh, who live in this area. So the point is, the point is that we have two different ways of life. And we have one that kills passenger pigeons and kills buffalo and kills species and causes vast degradation to the landscape. And we have another way of life that is not perfect and is not magical and is not, you know, without flaw. But it's much less destructive to the planet. And that's the basic essence of this discussion. If we talk about civilization and the environment is there's a conflict there. Sustainability is what you're saying. Then. Right. Yeah. Sustainability. See, a, part, a lot of what I think about when you talk about this is balance. And in an ideal world, we would have trade in order to get the imports from other areas in order to have a more diverse life. Mm -hmm. But really, unfortunately, when one has the power, they have the military, and they have the technology on their side, why pay for it when you can just take it? When you can take it. If you have a, you know, a military power that's superior, you have iron weapons versus their bronze. and there's no way that they can defend their territory and therefore you can just go in there and wipe them out. I mean, yeah. If you look at the late Bronze Age, which is what I've been studying a lot lately, is, you know, you have basically a lot of empires that existed and did have trade, you know, throughout these empires. You know, the Hittite, you know, mm. the Mycenaeans, the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. There's There were many different large empires at the time that did have common trade, you know, the Minoans and so forth. Um, but what, what's interesting and the most, you know, confounding about the, the late Bronze Age is why did it collapse? Right. Which is why I thought I'd bring it up now because interesting. there were a lot of factors involved. It's like a systems collapse, essentially, is what the, the main theory being promoted today is it wasn't just one thing that caused the collapse. It was multiple things. Right. Like what kind of things? Well, the, I mean, that's contested, mm -hmm. but uh, some of the things that people you know, bring forward as theories is that there was a combination of environmental. Um, mm. The trade itself was doing just fine, but there, there, what happened is the empires got, I think, too big, and it served only the upper echelons of the elite. That's it. And so you, you have evidence of, like, palace burnings, yeah. where the towns were fine. Yeah. And so that suggests that there was an internal revolt. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was not just in a localized area. It was throughout the Eastern Mediterranean that this happened. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but there were great earthquakes. There was, you know, there's written records of, you know, famine and all sorts of, you know, uh, natural disasters that happened during this mm -hmm. time period too. And I think people might have taken advantage of that. But uh, through Sense. the internal revolts, I believe that there, because there's the Sea Peoples, that's what, for decades, people have been saying that's what caused the collapse of all these empires, with the exception of Egypt. Sea so people as in mariners? As in pirates, basically, pirates. yeah. yeah Vikings raiders, and pirates. Essentially, yeah, the Bronze Age uh, Vikings, if you will, uh, without the racial context, is hmm. that these people raided all throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, just raised pretty much everything that they came across. But what's interesting about them is that they were known confederation. So that in association means that they were not just one group, they were multiple groups that came together. Right. 
and there is proof that there were multiple ethnic groups involved in this confederation. So mm. I, again, that kind of, in my opinion, makes it look like, well, perhaps this was an internal, you know, revolt, and mm -hmm. that the vacuum that was created was that these people, out of you know, survival as well as the prospect of being able to loot these empires, right. was really high. So. So you're saying that in those situations, the revolt was coming from without, from the outsiders coming in and taking uh, what the civilization had. Because it seems normal to me that people would, it's, our history is littered with kings rising and falling because right. eventually they lose so much touch with the people. And right. the people are stronger, and so they eventually will take over. Right. Um, I, I personally think it's a multiple, like it's an exterior and an interior factor that's going mm -hmm. on here. It's a really interesting. It was like it's like all the planets aligned for this event to take right. place, and it was so massive. I mean, it akin to the entire Western, you know, civilization that we have today collapsing. Mm -hmm. Trade after this was almost non-existent, and they went into dark ages for like two hundred years. So there were, really, I mean, writing was forgotten in Greece for almost two hundred years right. before it was actually taken up again. Um, wow. The factors in that are, are interesting because you know, in context of civilization, but I think. Mm -hmm. What's really important in the, you know, the context of like, um, you know, systems collapse as well as like environmental issues. I, yeah, I think that, I mean, a lot of these cities were built on fault lines and so forth that we found. And right. Mycenae was one of those. Which right. There's clear evidence of, you know, earthquake activity there that destroyed the, the city. But the impact on the environment, I mean, Lebanon was a, known for its cedar forests. Yeah. And completely decimated through... You know, uh, not only just the building of structures, but ships and so forth. Yep. Uh, it was a highly prized material in the ancient world. So I think it's all of these things coming together in Oak a... forest in ancient Greece. Exactly. Yeah, forest Greece, all over. Greece used to be totally covered in forests. Yeah. They're all gone. All of Homer, you know, you know, Homer's forests that he talked about, yeah, they're gone. They're gone. So you, know, you look at it now, and it's, it's a very arid environment. Same with Italy. Italy was very forested as well. So I think it's a lot of these systems that come together in, in a, the collapse that basically, you know, created this cascading effect, mm -hmm. which is interesting because out of this vacuum and this collapse comes democracy and the rise of Israel, as well as, you know, I mean, Egypt never really totally recovered, but you had the ability out of that to where democracy, the ideas of like democracy were created. And I think that's very interesting and telling because mm -hmm. people, are, I think, were looking for something other than, you know, just kings and queens. Despotism. Yeah, right. despotism, exactly. Right. So, but, um, yeah, I just thought that was, you know, an interesting correlation as far as, like, you know, that kind of impact. And yeah. this maybe that's a cycle. Maybe we need to get to a point where things collapse and then we rise up again in this sort of cyclical. Mm -hmm. But in, in your context, as far as sustainability, it's how we do that, I think, will... We'll, determine the length of time, the, you know, the bell curve of that event. And one of the basic premises of my view on this is that there is no such thing as a sustainable or a kinder, greener, friendlier version of civilization. There is a sustainable way of living, but it's not civilization. It's expressly not civilization based on the collapse of some of the empires you were talking about right. and based on anything post-agriculture that rises up as an empire that does seem to be a cyclical tendency toward collapse. And a great book on this that's actually really accessible is Ronald Wright's A Short History of Progress, which talks about the rise and fall of many empires. Right. Um, and he uses as a microcosmic example the people of um, Rapa Nui, more commonly known as Easter Island, right. who, and this is sometimes contested, but most um, anthropologists agree that what happened on Easter Island was that the ancestors told the islanders to, to build these giant you know, stone heads with for which the island is so famous. Um, to do that, they had to build these huge supports to carry those stone heads great distances along roads. Now, it's really shocking. It wasn't the roads that caused their worst deforestation. It was cutting down trees to build these frameworks to move these stone heads, the stones for these stone heads. So they built all these stone heads, built all these frameworks for the heads, and literally knew that they were cutting down their last tree and did it because their gods told them to. Wow. And if that's not a perfect metaphor for what civilized people are doing, thinking that we're going to find that somewhere there will be that, that distant hope of technology saving us or God saving us or Santa Claus or the gummy bears or whatever saving us down the road, 
I don't know what is. If it's not a perfect analogy for that kind of idea that eventually things will just get better if we keep trying hard enough, humans will figure it out. So what would you want to see? Like what would be a, a, a future uh, that we live in? Is it smaller villages? It's a really good question. And yeah, it would have to be. I mean, it's a really difficult thing to say and it's politically problematic on both sides of the usual way we think of things like conservative, liberal. It's radical. So it's, I like to think of it like this. Conservative and liberal are on a continuum that continually divide people into camps of red and blue so that they fight with each other. I like to think of radicalism not as being as it usually is portrayed further to one end or the other, but something different. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is just like that political view of radicalism is somewhere different. It's not on that spectrum of red, blue, you know, mm -hmm. right. conservative, well, liberal, one right, like, right. That, that we can get somewhere else mm -hmm. besides that with some, a radical thinking. And so I would like to see us learn from the way of life that's already here for us to learn from, to humbly ask people who still have traces of indigenous cultures, and there still are intact hunter-gatherer societies, and ask them what to do. But here's where it gets politically problematic. Mm -hmm. On the left, that means a vastly reduced human population. Say, that yeah. means things like yeah. controlling women's reproductive rights and some right. other potentially really nasty things. Mm -hmm. On the conservative side, it means, you know, you got to believe that there are environmental problems. You've got to, you know, and often that's on an extreme conservative, right? There's a denial of environmental loss and degradation. So, what, but to answer the question, what I envision is much smaller, a smaller human population. Because, guys, you know this, we're not the only ones here. Mm -hmm. There are other creatures with which we share this planet. And I think it's profound arrogance to believe that we humans are at the top as a great chain of being, which with, with which I'm sure you're all familiar. The idea, it, it came into prevalence in the Renaissance, but it's far before that. It's a medieval idea, right, of God at the top, and then angels, and then humans, and classes of humans, with kings at the top, of course, and clergy, and then down, down, down to the social classes, and what's below that? Animals. Yeah, it's a very homocentric view. Yeah, yeah, it's anthropocentric. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel a few ways about this. One of the first things that when you were talking that I was thinking about is I read an article that was linking uh, animals of different sizes and how they utilize calories. And the larger the animal, the more economic their systems are. So wow. hummingbirds use mm -hmm. a lot more calories per ounce than an elephant does. Right. Right. And it's linked also to cities in the same way. You, the, the infrastructure to pipe water in for 100,000 people if you were to just do that for 100 people, it would cost a lot more money, you know, uh, in relation to that. 100 here, 100 there, 100 there. Yeah, it's not, you're not just saying now it's a, it's $1,000 to I get, a, you know, 100 people and it's $10,000 to get to 1,100 people kind of thing. It's cheaper to mm. do more people. Yeah. Um, projects are cheaper too because they, you have the manpower to be able to actually do the projects. Right. But another thing, you know, kind of going against what I just said is, you think about planting and stuff, and a lot of people would say, oh, just rototill the soil to get it all nice and loose. Right. But expert people in the field, that system is perfect as it is. The right. soils are layered correctly. There's fungal Thank systems you. going on through there and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're just doing the first thing we know how to do. Okay, right. let's put a building right. here, and there probably is a better way to do it. Do we need a foundation? Yeah. Or whatever the, the situation is, but right. at the same time, it does make sense that if we can make it bigger, ultimately it's better because it's cheaper, more economic. And I don't mean cheaper in the sense of money. It takes less water. Less energy. You know, yeah. All those kinds and of resources. Things. Right. Yeah, less resources. It's an interesting point. Um, the problem, of course, is what happens when you have a civilization is that you get food stores, right? You have to get food stores from agriculture. It's how it works. You have to have food stores in order to sustain a population that large of the kind we're talking about. And when you have such a large, pop large population, you end up inevitably with overpopulation. And so even if it's more efficient per capita, which is what I hear you saying, to have larger systems, and you're right. I tell, and I mean, I selfishly, when I'm in a cynical mood, tell people, move to the cities, please. Mm -hmm. Go. But that's not because I have their best interests at heart. So that's not a nice thing to say for me. And I don't say it very often. Uh, because I love r rural spaces. And I frankly don't know how people survive cities, um, having grown up in, in a relatively rural area and having freedom to walk in the woods and freedom to take my daughter out for a walk in the woods. So I guess what I would say is because you always have that growing population within a civilized system, while bigger may be better in certain respects, 
I've, I'm not aware of a historical example um, where overpopulation wasn't one of the contending factors for the collapse of an empire. It really comes down to resources, though, too. I mean, right. Like what I, I like is the whole smart cities initiative, which the UN has been pushing, where they're promoting cities to essentially de-urbanize and actually start creating their own resources. And it's not so much being picked up a lot in the West yet. A lot of uh, Eastern countries are doing this sort of thing where they have, you know, rooftop mm -hmm. gardens and right. things like this, where people are right. becoming more sustainable within their environments. So whereas normally they would have to have these things shipped in because, of course, the land of which they live in, that you can't grow food right. on either, streets right. and malls and things right. like that. So all that stuff has to be shipped in. Well, not only is it more efficient, but it's also healthier, you know, and also creates cleaner air is to have, you know, themselves actually create their food. So that that's a big push. And I see that as a, as a way to kind of... It's not going to fix all the problems, obviously, because the cities are still going to need a, a lot of resources. But I think it's a smart way of looking at it hmm. and uh, a way for us to at least, you know, find a path forward. My question to you is, like, what do you, like, how do you see us moving forward from here? Because, like, mm -hmm. you mentioned the overpopulation and so forth. And I agree. I think, you know, really the only sustainable systems uh, are going to be, have to be localized. Right. You know, exactly. Not necessarily as far as I mean, populations are concerned, but just the resources, resources the extraction. The, the, yeah, the energy that's required has to be localized. You bet. And it has to be efficient in how they they get that energy. So, mm -hmm. my question to you is like, how do you how do you see that happening? I'm, I feel like I'm giving you guys really long answers. Are the answers too long? No. No. Not at all. Not at all. Because I have a long answer. Then I'll give you the longer version. The short version is you're right. There's a there's if you want to get fancy about it, there's an idea in environmental thought called bioregionalism, which means right. life place, right? Yeah. Parts. Bio life regio place. So right. life place. So living in your life place, which means living by life too, though. And this is where it gets longer. Um, one of my teachers and mentors, Jim Dodge, uh, along with Gary Snyder, our local you know uh, amazing kind of poet laureate of deep ecology. Mm -hmm came up with this idea along with others, you know, other friends. It wasn't just these two writers we know about, but they've they've written on the topic of bioregionalism. Um, and it's more than just the physical part. It's also a change in the way we see the world. Right. And I think that's essential, that we have to understand that we're part of a larger community of life. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to do that, just like the best way to move forward on a very materialistic kind of physical world, practical level, is to go local. Mm -hmm. As much as that just sounds like a cliche, like, think globally, act locally, man. Mm -hmm. right. There's some truth to that there because yeah. we're part of a global, a very increasingly globalized, well, maybe not anymore increasingly with all the nationalism lately, but a globalized world. And yet, what can we actually do? What can we control? What Aside can we from do? having tomatoes year round, you know, <laughs> there's really not much. Right. And like you said, too, right. like I think that uh, the idea of consumerism, you know, that modus, you know, operandi, all right, let's get more stuff. You know, I mean, it, that's really, I think that's really needs to change because that, so much energy is lost in yeah. stuff. You know, I mean, how many yeah. things do people have in their garage that they thought they absolutely needed, they don't need anymore? You yeah. know, I mean, it's amazing the amount of stuff. And, of course, that goes into, you know, uh, the sort of society that we've created, though, too. Yeah. But like you said, it's really something that we need to change our way of thinking as far as, like, our the way that we interact with our environment right. needs to change because it can't just be this right. all consuming, like, Oh, I could take this resource. And it's like, well, how can I take this resource or how can yeah. this resource be remade? Or even just, if you'll forgive me, get the language right and not call it a resource and think of it as in a more animistic way as something that's living. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Um, as well, you know, just in addition to what you're saying, because I think you're absolutely right. And right. I think it's kind of, um, it's an interesting conversation to be having, you guys. Well, I think in resource, I mean, more or less like, because the way I see it ultimately is it all comes down to energy. Right. So right. that's what I'm really referring to. Mm -hmm. That makes it's, sense. It's, it's the energy that, we're, that we need physically, but also like how much energy we need to take out of the environment. So there really has mm -hmm. to be a balance there, in mm -hmm. my opinion. So. Well, eating meat is a good example of that. It, yeah. it, it takes so much water and so much more energy to get the same caloric value out of beef than it would if we were to eat protein from plants. And I'm not, I'm not preaching vegetarianism, actually. Mm -hmm. I think meat's a good thing. 
but more of a condiment. And that's not really what our what our mentality is. It's not a special. Right. Oh, it's a wedding. You know, we're going to have meat or yeah, right. even even some with each meal. But it's always the the primary thing: a big chunk right. of steak. And right. That's a good point. It's another place we could learn from hunter gatherers because one of my favorite authors in the whole anarcho primitivist thing, if you want to put a label on it, is John Zerzan. He wrote a book called Future Primitive, and in that book he talks about gatherer hunters being a better term because uh, meat was I like it meat was a condiment right, can I right. quote you on that yeah, yeah yeah meat was really it was like we had a hunt oh right there's my protein there's my sustenance but it wasn't day-to-day -day sustenance it was once in a while needed to survive kind yeah. of a thing and even the sorry go ahead. no just the worldview thing I wanted to clarify what I meant when change the way we think about things and change the language of resources uh, Wildcat Daniel Wildcat Jr. a native author um, has a great book, really short and accessible, called Red Alert, that in which he talks about this analogy. If we take from the natural world, whether it's water, things we think of as dead matter, or animals, things we think of as acknowledged that they at least have a life, if not a spirit, right? Mm -hmm. But if we take and take and take from those things, we are using them like an ATM machine, mm -hmm. when really we should be treating them like relatives. And he has a great kind of thought experiment, which is, imagine taking, taking, taking from your friends or from your family, like they're an ATM machine, and see how long you remain part of that community. Right. So I don't that's know if you guys point. see the analogy, but sure. that's, that's yeah. and there's not exactly like hard science behind this, but if you look at people who live in reciprocity kind of societies versus people who live in more consumerist-based, highly extractive societies, there is a level of, there's a, quite a contrast between which one is lasts longer and which one takes less from the, the communities on which it depends. Well, I think about your story of the deforestation on Easter Island and how, because people were praising their God and worshiping their God, they just chopped down all the trees so they could make this monument. And yet, I'm sure people were thinking, well, these trees are not growing back as quickly as we're chopping them down. <laughs> right. But the mechanism wasn't there to be able to enact that because people right. were too focused on creating the monument. Right. I, I often wonder, like, these day and age, we are, as a society, involved in cons conservation and things That's like right. that, and we're focused on that. It, we, it must have always been that way, but how could something like that have happened? I, so I wonder, though. I wonder if we, if it had al if it has always been the case that people have this concept that we have of conservation or preservation. And the reason I question it is that I think it's a uniquely American idea, and really I think it's a uniquely modern. Amer like last 500 years, let's say, of American history since European contact and colonization, I think we came up with the wilderness idea. And the uh, uh, when we came up with the wilderness idea, we came up with the similar idea of, or the related idea, I mean to say, of conservation or preservation, mm -hmm. um, depending on how you look at it, right? And I think that's because that those things grew up out of Europeans coming from highly civilized, highly developed lands and encountering the new world and saying, holy crap, there are lots of trees here. There's lots of land in front of us. This is an inhospitable, threatening place. Um, I think that as we continued our, the, as well, you know, Western Europeans and uh, continued their march across the continent in the name of Manifest Destiny, we began to see some of the effects of what we were doing. So right around 1850 or so, we started to have this other set of voices come out with people like John Muir and the Transcendentalists, you know, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who were saying, wait, 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 progress is all good and that and all that, but look at what's happening around you. Look at these places that are threatened. Look at Yosemite. Look at um, whatever. Look at whatever wilderness you want to name. Look at the impact that our way of life and the spread of that way of life is having on these wild places. That's a really good point. And it makes me think there's when the conquistadors were were taking over things, or Vikings and pirates were pillaging, there was always another coast to find. There was always another hill right. to look over and find more resources. But now that we're in a world-centric view, we right. can see, yeah, the Brazilian rainforest is giant, but it's not infinite. And we can see the chunks being taken out piece by piece. And it's interesting, too, yeah. about that. That's is, it, Joe. You know, NASA's satellites, the LIDAR satellites that they use, uh, a lot in archaeology now, actually shows the Amazon being deforested during the time of the Maya and the Aztecs. It's true. Mm -hmm. Empire builders, though, again. Yeah. That's, and that's why I think the analysis that that I'm sort of bringing 
here today about civilization is an important one because it's not just because often you hear Europeans are the devils or you hear I don't know men are the devils right and there's and there are problems with Eurocentrism and there are problems with patriarchy but it's not a wholly you know uh, just a singular concept that's it that's it that's it's it it's a world concept unfortunately that's it I wanted to peep in for a sec here um, and bring in some of the aspects like it does not seem very feasible to go fully back to hunter-gatherer, especially with the population size we have now, like you said. Mm -hmm. And they're being thrown into the Reed Wild Project myself. Right. Like, I myself am one of the least technologically advanced or capable of modern <laughs> right, people right. that I know, personally. I think you live more simply than I do. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, I still have to acknowledge, and I, know, I acknowledge a hypocrisy sometimes in the movement, in and myself, where I um, wouldn't want to get fully give up things like writing or certain right. gadgets oh, yeah. or whatnot. Uh, these oh, yeah. things were are some things that civilization has brought us are immensely beautiful in the arts and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. Uh, is there a simplistic way to go about keeping some of the good things or incorporating all levels of the goodness of every uh, subsistence strategy? Yeah, gosh, you know that's such a big question. I hope so. <laughs> How can any of us know, right, on any of this stuff? As, as much as I, I love this stuff and I care about it and I learned some interesting things about ancient empires and like Chad has great things to say about the collapse of Bronze Age civilizations and all that. How can we know the answer to that question? Um, but so, and it was a multi-part question, yeah? Yeah, kind sure. Of, so, so to address the hypocrisy idea, that's why I started by saying my hands are red too. So there is a personal responsibility each of us needs to take just as human beings living on this planet. But personal responsibility doesn't mean that any one individual is entirely responsible for solving some of the problems that you might identify looking at something like civilization and its impact on the planet. So no one individual is entirely responsible. And individual change does not equate to social change. So if you do Everything on Al Gore's list of, of 50 things you can do to reduce global warming, you're only going to reduce uh, the carbon emissions that we're putting out as a, as a species by a fraction of the percentage we need to to reduce those carbon levels. Because industry, our industry is what creates the most waste. Our industry on every possible part of our way of life that you can name, whether it's water usage, the majority is used by municipalities and golf courts for not for drinking water or human use day to day. It's used for these huge, massive projects to keep the infrastructure running. So personal responsibility does not equate to social change, and no one person should be held accountable. And I think one of the reasons you get people feeling resp overly responsible is that it feels like no one else is noticing and no one else is paying attention. And I even though I think about this kind of dark stuff a lot and talk about the apocalypse and dystopia and dystopian fiction in my English classes that I teach, I still remain an optimist. And my optimism is based on basically a faith in humanity, as much as I hate some of the things we've done, and a faith that we will, we want to do better, and we can learn from our mistakes. And that's the only shot we've got. Um, the final thing you asked, I think, it was actually a three-part question. The final thing I, I remember from your question, Jesse, that I remember from your question is how can we keep some of the beautiful things that have grown out of civilization or that at least have grown alongside civilization and are kind of dependent on it now, like writing, breakthroughs in science and technology. I like running water to be inside. I like running water in general. And Hot need, water is nice too. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. And we need rivers to run in order to have water. We need river systems to run first and foremost. But I also like to have indoor plumbing. So how do we keep some of these things? It's a good question. It's not one I'm prepared to answer in any kind of conclusive way. Except for I would say this. If it comes to a choice between a river and a faucet, I'll choose the river. And arts are beautiful, but I don't find more beauty in a painting by Rembrandt than I do in the cave paintings in Lascaux. France. I actually find the latter far more beautiful. Personal choice as far as the beauty of art. And humans have been making art long before humans were making civilizations, long before the advent of the plow. We were making beautiful art. And 
as beautiful as The Four Seasons by Vivaldi is, I'm going to steal a joke from a, one of my favorite authors. Vivaldi, Vivaldi was a fucking cover artist. Because The Four Seasons were there long before Vivaldi ever was. <laughs> nice. Okay. Nice. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Thanks for being guys. here. Yeah. Um, there's so thank much you. to talk about. I We're going to do this again, absolutely. Great. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for another episode of the Words Wise podcast. Please leave a like. And what do you think? We've been talking a lot about this subject today, and there's comments ready to, for us to hear. So we're really interested in what you have to say. Thank you again, and have a good night. Thank you.